Most of us in the interior are vaguely familiar with the area called Delta. It's about 100 miles south of Fairbanks on the Richardson Highway, and we know of it because it's the junction where we get on the Alaska Highway heading south to Toke and the Canadian border. Delta Junction is the place we may stop to fill up with gas and get a quick bike to eat. We know there's some sort of farming going on in the area, at least that's what we've read in the paper. As we drive through, we may remember that the Army has an installation nearby, Fort Greeley, isn't it? We may even recall something about a buffalo herd in the area. For the majority of us, that's about all we know of this Delta place. If we do stop for a few minutes to stretch our legs, we can't imagine many people living around here. Some soldiers, a few gas stations and motels, and some crazy farmers back in the hills, right? Wrong. Including the military, over 3,600 people live and work in the Delta area, and most of them wouldn't live anywhere else. Fort Greeley is a major cold region's training and test center for the Army. The Delta Agricultural Development Project is one of the most ambitious and thus far successful undertakings the state's been involved in since the construction of the oil pipeline. And the people? Well, they're some of the friendliest folk you'll find. Opinionated, hardworking, determined, and fun-loving. You get the feeling this is one big extended family. Pass the salad, please. This is the monthly Chamber of Commerce dinner and meeting. This is a place where you quickly get to know your neighbors, and you know their neighbors who will be there to help you out when you need it. Tonight, among other things, a new queen of the Deltan affair was crowned. pretense around here you know you pretty well know where everybody stands um, we we fight among ourselves in the community but don't don't nobody from the outside <laughs> come down <laughs> and and uh, because you're gonna be in trouble from everybody I think the uh, people are as a community uh, it's, it's a it's a good warm small uh, community small town community and uh, uh, there's always a place for you here if you want to come in. People will listen to you, may not agree with you. People in Delta definitely take an active and informed part in their community. Back at the Chamber of Commerce meeting, Dave Johnson of the local Department of Fish and Game office talked about the Delta bison herd and efforts to resolve problems of the herd destroying crops. Fish and Game is an important state agency in Delta because this is a favorite area for sportsmen. Alaska's favorite winter sport for participant and spectator alike always draws a good crowd around here. Mike Coates. Um, I live in Delta. I've lived here for approximately five and a half years. Uh, I've raised dogs for three years. 
My name is Bob Luzardi. I've lived here for 12 years, about. And uh, I farm, and I run dogs, and uh, I work construction, so I make my living. I think it all fits together. I think it's just perfect. You, know, you farm in the summer, you run dogs in the winter. It's a thing that would be better. I like the small town atmosphere of Delta. Uh, there's things I don't like, the wind especially, I guess. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, goods and bads about Delta, but I think the goods um, are better than the bads, keep you here. So how'd you do in the race today? Not very good, I got disqualified. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I missed the trail, I missed one of the turns. Just about a mile and a half out, I just didn't get out very far, so today hasn't been a very good day. One minute. Delta has its share of serious trappers and hunters. Many of them live far from the matting crowd. For the most part, they are not the active, development-oriented group you saw earlier at the Chamber of Commerce, although both groups do live in harmony. There's enough room and acceptance for everyone to live out his own dream in Delta. These folks may work regular jobs, teaching, military, road maintenance, and construction, but in their hearts, they're running a trap line with their dog team. Large-scale construction projects brought many workers to Delta and helped establish the community. In 1942, it was the building of the Alaska Highway, which officially ends here. This milepost has been a welcome sight to many a motorist. More recently, the construction of the oil pipeline gave a boost to the local economy. Pump Station 9 is a few miles south of town and has about 30 full-time employees. Others work full-time on maintenance crews for this section of the pipeline. Everyone agrees Delta Junction would not be the growing second-class city it is today without Fort Greeley, located a few miles south of town. And a pleasant good afternoon to you. It's Afternoons Live right here at Fort Greeley. I'm your host, Army Specialist Ron Lee, right here on AFRN 1360. It's about 13 minutes before the hour of 3 o'clock right now. Originally constructed as an Army air base during World War II, it officially became Fort Greeley in 1955. Its mission is to provide administrative and logistical support to the Army's Northern Warfare Training Center and the Army's Cold Regions Test Center, as well as maintaining the Allen Army Airfield. About 850 GIs and their dependents provide a stable economic base. The post provides a wide variety of services and activities for its personnel, like this garage where you can spend a windy winter afternoon dissecting your engine. The residents of Delta are also able to enjoy many of the post's recreational activities, things like movies and swimming. More importantly, there are over 200 civilians working at Fort Greeley, Delta Junction's main source of employment. Delta is also a place for the adventurous, like Paul Nistler, who saw the potential of the area long ago. Paul and his wife Loretta have found Delta to be the ideal home.
people come here for all different reasons. Some are up here because they've been in the military, and then when they are through with the military, they come back to work. Uh, some have come to work on the pipeline and decided to stay because they liked the area. Others have come to farm to get land. Uh, business brought them in or something, but we have people from all different regions and fields. And it's, it's a good area. I didn't come to Alaska to homestead. I came to Alaska to see what it's like up here. I was probably 22 or 21, I don't know, back over 30 years ago anyway. It was in 1950 when I came up. Well, then the country grows on you. I spent the summer and then I went in the Army for two years, most of the time in the States, and I couldn't wait to get back up here. But I was still scared of winter, so I went back again. Took the third time to decide to stay. And then it, it grew on you. I just couldn't wait to get back. And the opportunities here are just, I guess I'll stay here all the time. Too many people start things and then give up. You just got to keep grinding away, and pretty soon it starts falling away. I don't know what to do with myself when I have two or three days that I can, so I'm not going to retire. I'll keep hauling dirt, farming, hope to keep hauling the kids for a few more years anyway. In addition to the bus service, the Nistlers built and owned the only office building in town. Loretta says her editorship of the Delta paper, which she helped to start, is her hobby. Paul's hobby is the care and feeding of his livestock. One of the first things that Paul and his brother did was to, to build a, a one-mile road in to reach their homesteads. And we have one picture here of Paul standing out by the corner of uh, Nistler Road and Clearwater Road when they put up a sign so people could find them. And the road was pretty primitive then. We um, had a lot of mud in the spring and a lot of snow drifts in the winter. I think that's probably one of the biggest improvements when the state rebuilt the road and took over maintenance of it. That's been a big help out here. Ten years from now, I suppose we'll have a population of about 10,000 people. Uh, I hope it don't happen just overnight. Kind of hard to buy school buses that fast and even finance. Uh, I hope it keeps going like it has in the past 20-some years, you know, gradual growth. Uh, I feel that any city, any business, or even any individual, if he doesn't keep going forward, progressing, he's going to go backwards, you can't stay even or the way you want it. You got to keep, keep expanding, keep building. And I look for Delta to do it. These days, as for the past several years, farming is the main topic of interest in Delta. The main question is whether or not this could become the breadbasket of Alaska. The state has made land available, not enough land, local farmers will tell you, for agricultural purposes only and provided low-interest loans to help finance the incredibly expensive business of farming. It is a massive and ambitious undertaking. The 60,000 acres released for agriculture under Delta I is already producing high-quality barley and rapeseed. I think this is the uh, spirit of the community that uh, Delta's going to grow. Uh, one of the reasons for the Ag Project being here uh, to starting off in this particular part of the state was the fact that Delta Junction, the folks in the community in the Delta Junction area, along with some, some of the Salch area, of course, and the Salch a big Delta land use plan, uh, which 
the state suggested that each community do, but Delta did it. So whenever we came along looking for a place to start an agriculture project, Delta Junction had their, their uh, areas designated uh, that, uh, and the soils tested and things so that we would knew where to go. All this activity has brought other businesses to the area to support the farmers. As the crops grow, so do related economic activities. I'm Gene Carlson and I work for Craig Taylor Equipment Company. We're the John Deere dealership in Alaska. And the story here in Delta Junction uh, primarily was set up to cater to the agricultural industry here. Well, we've got a, a, a real diverse group of people that are, are trying to farm here right now as I indicated before. Uh, some of them are, are very young people trying to get their, they have farming at heart, they've been raised on farms. And in Delta One, it was a one-shot thing. A once in a lifetime opportunity to get a big parcel of land at a reasonable, uh, under reasonable conditions. Not that anything is given to them. It's all payback. They don't, they don't give these people anything. And uh, yeah, they're a hardy group to, to just tackle it. So we have the young, the old, and everything in between. And, but, but they're all farmers. And I don't know if they have to be any hardier than any farmers anywhere else. Because like I said, the, a farmer is a farmer. And uh, he goes through some pretty rough times and, and doesn't roll over and die. The Shanks, father, mother, daughter, and son, are one of the farm families who believe their dairy farm will one day be part of a large, stable economic base of agriculture for Delta and the state. My name is, is uh, Neil Shank. We've been here in Delta Junction for three years. We've been in Alaska for 12. And I was raised on a dairy farm in Michigan. My wife is uh, from uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin. And I've always wanted a dairy, but we had this one problem. We were in love with Alaska. And opportunities about three years ago just, well, I come up when they first started the clearing in the Delta project here. I had a friend who was clearing out there, and I wasn't doing anything in the winter because I was a carpenter and I built houses, so I come up to help Kurt one winter. And my first impression of Delta was, who the devil would want to live here, you know? And I had always felt that way about interior Alaska. It's too cold, nobody wants to live there. And as they begin to clear in the project and get some of that land open up where I could see what it was, I decided that uh, there was a lot of potential here. And uh, so there was a state lottery come along and I believe this was 79, this piece come up. Or maybe it was 80, no, I think it was 79. Anyway, we had friends try and file for a piece of land, file for a piece of land. We don't want a piece of land, we don't want to live in Delta. So finally, the last day we could file, we decided to go in because, well, we're always going to stay in Alaska anyway. So we went in and filed. And uh, so that, that's how we came. And then we had this piece of land, and we really didn't have any plans for it. We made arrangements to have it cleared, but uh, we, we really didn't know what we were going to do with it. I wanted a farm, but the capital investment is just astronomical, you know, and we didn't know if we really wanted to do that. And we, the way things worked out that summer, uh, we ended up, we filed a, a, uh, a financial plan to put in a dairy, and they approved it. And so a year ago, last September, we poured the concrete for the barn. The entire family shares the heavy workload along with one hired hand. If you ask both parents and children of the farm families, they'll tell you all the work is good for them. For one thing, it keeps the kids out of trouble. They say that's because they don't have time to go looking for trouble after chores. There is no time to work out. Our day starts at 4.30 in the morning, and usually we get to the house about 7.30 in the evening. Uh, so there is no time for anything else. As far as the family goes, uh, this is our second year on the farm, and we have taken anywhere from $700 to $1,200 a month to live on, and that's pretty tight. You couldn't pry us out of Delta. I have been all over the western U.S., and this is home. I wouldn't go anywhere else, and I'm serious about that. We like it. We really like it. Uh, for instance, the first summer we spent here, we had been in Alaska almost 10 years. It was the first summer the whole family ever had a suntan. I didn't realize they had summer in Alaska, you know. We'd lived in the Anchorage area and down on the Kenai, and there's a just cooler temperature. We love it here, and the people are great. You couldn't find a nicer bunch of people.
One of the major problems faced by Delta farmers is the need for the crucial secondary services to process and store the labor of their efforts. For instance, the shanks needed a dairy to process and sell their milk. With customary straightforward sense, the problem was faced and solved by the Lindelman family. They too needed a place to process the milk from their cows, and they decided to do it themselves. Thus, Northern Lights Dairy was born. I work out at Fort Greeley myself, and uh, we uh, put in 40 hours out there a week. And my wife used to work at the co-op. Now she's devoting full time to here now, and hopefully someday I can do the same. I'm Lois Littleman, Don's wife, and I over pretty well oversee running the biggest share of this. I run her all on Tuesdays and Thursdays with the help of another girl who helps me to do the packaging. On Sundays, the family gets involved because we package half times, so which takes a little more help to put up. And, and basically, it's a lot of work. Package oh, probably about 1,400 gallons. Biggest share of it up in six gallon dispenser boxes. This will go to the schools and the restaurants, and a lot of it goes to Pluto Bay. Like all the farmers around Delta, Don Littleman's workday is a long one. Oh, golly. Just a rough guess, probably about 16 to 17 hours a day. And does he ever get to take a vacation? Well, we did. Last year, we had a chance to go to uh, the Goodyear Tire Farm down in Phoenix, Arizona, at Lesfield Park. Uh, my wife and I, we went down there for about three days. We enjoyed it very much. The boys, they took over. They ran the operation pretty good. There's a no-nonsense, let's get it done attitude about all these adventuresome farmers in Delta. They firmly believe it is a matter of when and not if agriculture will be the primary economic activity in the interior. And they may be right. You can buy Northern Lights dairy products at the stores in Fairbanks. It's a big gamble. Farming's a big gamble, boy, and, and uh, when, when you're... Uh, uh, handling the uh, thousands of dollars worth of uh, that they handle, you know, the, just just to buy their equipment, you're looking at a just to barely get a run and start. You're looking at a quarter to half a million dollars uh, before on uh, some of those bigger tracks out there. I'm sure there's a half a million dollars tied up in equipment. That's before you put a grain in the ground. <laughs> Shortly after this program was taped, a fire destroyed the Lindelman processing plant. However, they were insured and planned to rebuild immediately. Luckily, no one was injured. It's tough, if not impossible, to keep a Delta farmer down. The development of agriculture in Alaska is a unique situation. Everywhere else in the nation, farming was the first stable economic activity. Cities and towns grew up around the farms. Storage facilities, processing plants, transportation systems, and other secondary activities grew at the same time. Exactly the reverse has taken place in Alaska. The cities and towns are settled and in place with no agricultural base. Can the state and the farmers in Delta turn around and develop in Alaska in a few short years what took decades to build elsewhere? Is the Ag Project merely a political exercise or the dawn of a new age of farming in Alaska? We need land to support all this. There, there, there's a, an infrastructure here that we need. And in some ways, I suppose some of the farmers probably feel like guinea pigs in any you know, type of experiment you do. What happens to the guinea pig when they're all done? Well, we don't intend to go that way. Well, this has basically been the spirit of Delta, you know. They're certainly not uh, like the uh, one 
one big uh, difference between Delta and Fairbanks is, is that when something a little adverse happens, they don't roll up the sidewalk and cry. They just roll back and uh, uh, take a new attack. And after a hard week's work in Delta, what better way to unwind than a little square dancing? Circle up.